We're going to the second part of the day after the wonderful introduction this morning and setting up the stage. Now we're going to be diving toward this roadmap for uh, trust and human rights and democracy with AI. And for that, we're going to be starting with the first session, which is really about understanding what it means to think about human-centered AI. Uh, our guests are uh, Rachel uh, Adrenli, who's partner and uh, general counsel at IDEAL. I'm going to introduce her more uh, precisely soon. Jess Halbrook, who's Google uh, expert in UX and AI research at, at PEAR. And then Deb Rowe, who's founder of Cortico and associate professor of machine learning at MIT Media Lab. So we're going to start in order by having Rochelle give us the first uh, sense of what a human uh, center AI is. So give me an introduction of Rochelle. So Rochelle Andranli is partner and general counsel as well as legal design lead at IDEO. IDEO is the famous design firm that we all know in the Bay Area. But she walks a fine line between the rule-based world of law and the non-real rule-based world of innovation. Rochelle actually co-created IDEO's legal design innovation practice in 2015 to help law firms, law schools, public sector clients, and criminal justice reform advocates across the globe to embrace design thinking against a very rigid legal landscape. So today in her role, she is using human-centered design to bring fresh approaches to legal problems and processes, working alongside designers and clients to navigate the complexities and challenges faced with the intersection of innovation and the law. Please give a warm welcome to Rochelle and hear more about designing with data for an inclusive center society. Good afternoon. So IDEO is a human-centered design firm, and we've, we've been that way for probably 30 of the last 40 years. And I say that because our roots were in pure product design originally. And about 30 years ago, a woman named Jane Fulton Surrey joined IDEO, and she brought the concept of human factors. Uh, the idea being, we can't just design in a vacuum. We can't just design products because they're cool or interesting. We have to think about the humans that are going to be interacting with the products. And she actually met with a fair bit of resistance, uh, but kept at it until IDEO embraced at its core the idea of human factors and designing for humans, as opposed to designing products and hoping humans could figure them out and learn them. So what we're here today is to kind of go one step further and say, you know, what is human-centered design of AI? And I'm going to talk a little bit about it from the principled perspectives, and then my panelists, I think, will give some really great examples of what they're doing in their work that's bringing that to life. We don't have the answers at IDEO. We have some ideas. Um, we have some frameworks. We have some learnings over time, but we think that this is an area we're all working toward together. So this is a simple framework we use when talking about human-centered design generally. So for us, human-centered design is always starting with people. And what is desirable from a human point of view? Both what do people want, but what do people need? So putting humans at the center and always using empathy as our core value. From there, we want to think about like what, what is it feasible from a technological point of view to do? And this is where AI gets really exciting. People are very excited, like what, you know, what, can, what can data do? What can data science do? What can AI do? So what is, it, what is that meld of what is desirable for humans and what is feasible from a technological point of view? And then for us, when we're designing for clients, we're always thinking about, is this viable for the business, right? Something may be uh, solve a human need, maybe technologically possible, but if it isn't really viable for a business, then that's not really what, what our clients are going to be interested in. And so for us, innovation is always at that center point of the desirability, the feasibility, and the technology. And that's what we call innovation. But now with the promise of AI, I think there's a lot of focus just on that feasibility. And for us, we've had to take a pause and say, just because AI can solve the problem doesn't necessarily mean it should, right? There are a lot of problems and challenges that just need to be solved at the human level or the process level. Um, and then there are problems that AI can actually be really helpful for. Another thing that we think is we don't believe that data is truth. Data is data, and data is created by humans. And so like the video we just saw from Joy, we can bring 
all of our biases and blind spots to bear when we're creating data and data sets if we're not careful, right? So we're always cautious that we're not over-indexing on data or assuming it's the truth. We always want to think about what biases and errors that we might be bringing to data. Okay, so why are we excited about AI? So IDEO acquired a data science firm, Datascope Analytics, last fall, and we're scaling data and data design as a discipline throughout the organization, as many organizations are doing. And why? Because we're excited about making products, services, and systems dynamic, adaptive, and capable of learning. And that's pretty exciting when you think about it, right? You know, so IDEO for years has been working in products and services and systems. We've been designing products, services, and systems. But now we're thinking about how do we make those products, services, and systems dynamic, adaptive, and capable of learning. And for us, we don't talk about artificial intelligence as much as we talk about augmented intelligence, right? So for us, it's not AI for the sake of AI. It's how do we use data, data science, augmentation, to help humans be better and to solve human problems. And I think this is gonna, I know this is definitely a theme with Jess as well. I was listening to a podcast with Adam Grant recently and he was talking about, you know, the negative connota connotations from the word artificial, right? Usually we don't like artificial. Artificial means fake. If you have an artificial sweetener, does that sound good? No, it doesn't sound great, right? So we think about, you know, why would you want something artificial when you could have something that's more augmented? And as I mentioned, at its core, it's just really about working with data and working about data with data in different ways, from machine learning to neural networks to predictive analytics, like kind of all these exciting things that we can bring to bear to solve problems. And again, for us, it's not about the technology for the technology's sake. It's about bringing the technologies and the capabilities to bear to solve real human problems. An example for this is we did a proof of concept um, exhibition where we created an empathy machine. So the idea would be like, how can we use augmented intelligence to help us learn about each other? How can we help us learn to have more empathy with each other? If we're gonna be communicating mostly through screens, through text, through mediated um, media like that, how can we make sure we're not losing our human connection? So again, it's not just technology for technology's sake, but what can we learn about each other and make our lives better? So we believe that human-centered AI has the potential to serve people well. And I'm guessing everybody in this room thinks that too, or you wouldn't be here. Um, some of the things we get excited about is how we can better inform and guide organizations. About three weeks ago, I hopped on BART, and before I even got out of the tunnel heading to the East Bay, I had a text from Wells Fargo and a text from Chase that said, did you authorize these transactions? And I looked in my bag and my wallet was gone, right? And I, I know it's a bummer, but it's exciting really though to think about <laughs> that the bank knew my wallet was stolen before I did. And before I even was out of, out of the tunnel, these credit cards were shut down, right? And so we're thinking about like, how is that possible, right? How is that possible? Because, but they have so many amazing algorithms that they can notice something anomalous so quickly and get in touch and get confirmation. And so that's a fantastic way to use data to better inform and guide, guide those organizations, right? Um, enhancing safety. How many of you are doing smart city work? Anybody in here doing smart city work? Yeah. Yeah, it's exciting, right, to think about how can we make our cities smarter and safer from knowing when lighting goes out to knowing when there's suspicious activity to knowing when something gets broken or or there's potholes or whatever, like how can we make our, 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 our cities and our, our um, environments safer? Unlocking new insights. So if you think about all the medical data in the world, you know, we can only move so fast as humans in looking at data, reviewing medical records, making connections, but with the predictive power of, and the processing of data today, we can unlock a lot of new insights. So something, is, something like drug interactions, right? Typically people can just sort of study a drug and its side effects, but with the processing power we have today, we can unlock a whole host of new insights about drug interactions and things like this that weren't possible before. Making, the visible, making visible the previously hidden. 
And again, I go back to you know, the, the um, anti-money laundering of banks or organizations. So in the past, you, know, you could kind of figure out maybe this is suspicious activity on an account. But now through network analysis, you can figure out, well, there's, there's suspicious activity here, and these people are related here. Maybe there's something going on. Maybe that's a connection. And so we can uncover money laundering activity by using neural networks. And then finally, how can we prompt positive behavior change? One of the startups and residents we had at IDEO recently was called Rise Science. And Rise Science believes that better sleep is better for not everybody, but for athletes. Does anybody think they'd be better if they had more sleep? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, you know, they've used data to help people track their sleep, right? Fitbits and things like that. What's also interesting, though, is they've not just used the data, they've paired that with like human coaching and scaling uh, coaching and support networks to really not just help people see when they're not sleeping well, but prompt people to sleep better, right? So, again, what is that right balance of showing people through data what they need to know and then using, using other support mechanisms to help positively affect behavioral change? And then as a lawyer, this one is the one I get most excited about. Like, how do we best use our time, effort, and resources to support, empower, and delight others? About a year, a year and a half ago, there was a headline that said, J.P. Morgan Chase's computer has taken off 360,000 hours of billable lawyer time, right? If you're in-house as a lawyer, that's fantastic, right? Like, if I could free up 360,000 hours for me and my team, that would be awesome. If you're in a law firm, that works the opposite, but that's a different story for another day. But the idea is like that, the idea that we can you know, take some of the rote uh, tasks away from people, people that always say, like, I wish I had more time for thinking, uh, learning, being creative, but I can't because I have to answer all these emails and I have to do all these rote tasks, right? So that gets super exciting as well. And I think this is very much on people's mind, though. Where does it go wrong? And these are some of the things that we think about a lot when we're designing with data. Marginalizing vulnerable populations or ignoring vulnerable populations. So we think about something like family planning, uh, research on sexual behavior. Most of the research that's been done to date has been on populations that are known as weird, which is Western, educated, industrial, ri rich, and de democratic countries, right? So the weird populations. Um, and what's tough about that is that means that if you're not in those categories, um, policies and initiatives that are designed for those categories aren't being considered, right? So we have to think about like where, what are we studying and who are we leaving out and then what are the effects of that? Invading privacy. So I'm sure everybody has thought about this on a lot of occasions. I pulled a kind of an old example here, but the Facebook Beacon Project from 2007, if anybody remembers that, it's the one where Facebook was posting on your wall commercial transactions you made. And the, the famous one, the one that is really sad when you think about it, is the guy who purchased a diamond ring for his girlfriend on overstock.com, and within a few hours was getting congratulations messages from all his friends and his girlfriend on Facebook, but he hadn't actually proposed yet. So thinking about, yeah, it's such a bummer. Yeah, so thinking about, you know, well-meaning in terms of promoting these merchants, but really invading the privacy and taking away agency and choice from people without thinking through the consequences. And this, I think Joy's um, video did a fantastic job, like just building off of or exacerbating pre-existing biases or perpetuating discrimination. The example here we like to think about is um, Robert McDaniel in Chicago in 2013, a uh, young African-American man. And police knocked on his door and he opened and they said, we're watching you. And he was like, you're watching me? And what had happened was he'd been placed on Chicago's, what they called the heat list, which was an index of approximately 400 people that the city um, had compiled of people that were supposedly likely to be violent criminals in the future, even though that hadn't been who he was. Um, and so we think about, you know, how are, we, how are we using predictive policing and predictive analytics in a way that just perpetuates stereotypes, right? And so finally, we want to think about, like, so given all that, given the excitement we have about the potential, things we worry about that keep all of us up at night, like what might a human-centered approach look like? So for us, we always want to be thinking about the people behind the data, right? Whose data is it? How are we using it? Can people be identified by that data? Did they consent to it? And uh, 
I'm sure most of you are aware that the GDPR came into effect about two, two weeks ago, just over two weeks ago. And I think it really gives some great guidelines. We feel like that's a really human-centered regulatory approach because of the rigor it places on informing people of what you're doing with their data in each instance, not just sort of like, we'd like to use your data. Here's how we'd like to use your data now and going forward, and getting your explicit consent to it. So for us as human-centered data designers, we actually think that the GDPR is really helpful. It's also important to think about the people who are entering the data, right? So, you know, if you look at like nurses in hospitals or people that take notes, right? Forcing them to take notes in a structured way can actually be counterproductive, right? So if you're trying to capture data in a certain way, thinking about who's capturing the data, who's using it, and how do you make it likely that you're going to get good data, not force people into doing structured data when really the unstructured data is what they're most comfortable with. This is super important to us. You know, client teams change, corporate strategies change, and data can be lent or sold to other groups. So for us, we have to think about what data we're collecting now, but just what might happen to it going forward, right? And so for years at IDEO, we've done a lot to anonymize data for this very reason, right? We, we want to talk to people, we want to learn from them, but we don't know what's going to happen if we turn it over to our client or if they turn it over elsewhere. So really thinking about not just what are we using it today, but who might use it going forward. You can imagine cases where cities have, um, like the city of New York was trying to take passport information of non-citizens to help them um, get an ID card to register for services. And you can imagine in a changing immigration landscape, um, how dangerous that can be for people, right? So thinking about like, yeah, we have benevolent uses for this data, but what if it gets collected or into the wrong hands? Thinking about the impact at scale of individuals as well as groups and communities. So the example I like to think about here is Waze, right? So Waze is fantastic. It shows us what streets to go onto and where to avoid communities or where to avoid traffic. But sometimes what it does, it sends you through like a neighborhood and there's not much traffic in that neighborhood because it's a neighborhood. Right? And so these neighborhoods can become congested with all kinds of traffic from people who are trying to save five or 10 minutes off their commute. So again, thinking about that was, that's good for that individual who's getting to work five minutes faster, but that's tough for that neighborhood who, you know, now they've got a bunch of street, uh, cars coming down their street. And then finally, how might we reduce biases on our data? Right? So what biases do we have that we're bringing to the data sets we create? And so diversity is super key in all of this. So at IDEO, we believe very much in having cross-disciplinary teams and very diverse teams because we all have amazing amounts of blind spots. And we have to make sure we're checking those blind steps co constantly. And then the final thing is, how are we mitigating the potential negative outcomes of our design? So we have to think about, again, with, like we think about where does data go, where does the design go? And sometimes we don't know. We don't know where it's going to go, but we have to kind of think through. If this was used by a benevolent uh, user, what would be the outcomes? And what if it was used for a not benevolent user, what might be the outcomes? So these are just some of the principles we keep in mind when designing with data. Okay, Jess? So as we, as we understand the first understanding of the general framework from design with AI, let's dive a little bit more into AI from a personal and community perspective and, and go deeper into how AI can be beneficial from someone who has Google is doing this every day. Jess Holbrook is a UX manager and UX researcher in the research and machine intelligence group at Google. He and his team are taking a combined human-centered and technology approach to building AI-powered products like, and you're going to hear him talking about it, Google Clips, Google Lens, and AIUI project. He co-leads PEAR, which is the People Plus AI Research Group at Google, and his motivation basic is behind democratize, how to democratize AI to help people solve meaningful problems for themselves and their communities. Please, welcome for Jess. Like this little guy? Oh, hey, there it is. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Jess. Um, like Amir said, I'm a UX researcher at Google. I co lead our PAIR initiative, which is really looking at uh, how do people and AI partnerships uh, become enjoyable, productive, and fair. Um, other things we do at PAIR is so PAIR is kind of like a cross Google consortium network, whatever you might want to call it. We do a few different things. We do basic uh, research on AI and, and with AI. Uh, we publish academic papers, we put on events, 
Um, and it was really kickstarted by two research scientists in our research org, uh, Fernando Villegas and Martin Wattenberg, um, and who they really wanted to humanize uh, uh, AI is the way that they put it. And so they came and they asked me to join. And uh, to be honest, I was kind of like, why me? Uh, Google is filled with tons of academics, tons of brilliant people. Um, and the thing that uh, they wanted my help on is uh, I'm more of a product guy, I would say. I like shipping things. I like to solve problems by making something and learning from people and, and trying to get something in the world and, and see if it makes a difference. Um, and that was really what they were looking for. Um, and so we've kind of teamed up and we've been, we've been at this for almost a year now. And you know, as soon as we teamed up, uh, we, had a, we had a symposium and we started to talk about these concepts that we've been talking about internally for a while. And one of them you'll see here is like human-centered machine learning. This was like a term we started kind of kicking around to actually talk about the process of building uh, with machine learning um, to make AI products that are human-centered. Um, and so kind of throughout, you know, we've talked about these different terms that I hear, at least in my circles, kicked around. We talk about human-centered machine learning, human-centered AI, the UX of AI, uh, kind of all these things. And what I'd like to do is, is give some examples of how I think either we're start, you know, the, the title of my talk is a start to human-centered design, uh, human-centered AI at Google. And so I'd like to go through really just a bunch of different examples of all the different ways that I, I think that we're, we're starting to take a human-centered uh, approach. Uh, it's all of this. So I'll, I'll kind of start with what I call just everyday AI or sometimes benign AI. Like there's, there's very exciting, fanciful versions of AI and then there's kind of the AI all around us. So there have been things that have been AI powered that are, that are out there in the world and, and have been for quite some time. So like voice search uh, on your phone, you know, this is about 20% of the searches right now has been using uh, various forms of NLP and, and AI for a long time. Uh, Google Photos is one of the most famous examples, so we kind of took research from the Google Research Department paired with the Photos team and they were able to start categorizing by things like smiles and hugs and, and everything like that. Um, some of the autocomplete work is another really big example. So this started with replying to messages from other people and now it's expanding into uh, Gmail and composition uh, examples. One of the things I think is really f fascinating about here too is uh, I'm always kind of obsessed with how can we apply AI to some of the biggest problems, not like minor inconveniences. Uh, sometimes though it's interesting, like solving a minor inconvenience reveals a, a bigger problem that you weren't, you weren't aware of. So as they've started to, 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 to uh, put this out to the public, they've realized they're actually solving a pretty big accessibility challenge for a lot of people where typing out full or sentences or everything they'd want would, would be a considerable amount of, of work on their part. Uh, Google Translate is another one of the, the big examples out there. One of the things I really like about this that I think is starting to become more human-centered is more and more of this is happening on the device. So no data ever leaves the phone. Uh, it's recognizing text in real time and translating it, matching fonts and all these kind of things. Uh, a couple projects that I personally worked on or our team worked on, another one was something called Now Playing. So this is in uh, the latest versions of the Pixel phones. So it's really just uh, what it's doing is there's a model running on device that's listening for music. And if you look down at your phone at a particular time, it probably recognized the song. You know, there's a limit to how many it can recognize, but it recognizes kind of the big ones. Um, and it gives you that information. And one of the things I really like about this is that it's running entirely on device and only recognizes songs. So it's not some kind of uh, service that's always running, listening to everything, and it's sending nothing to the cloud ever. Uh, the favorite way to demo this is you throw your phone into airplane mode and you show it recognize a song. Uh, another one that our team worked on is Google Lens. So this is starting to use the viewfinder uh, on the camera app to be able to look, around the look at the world around you and learn more about it and sometimes act on it. Uh, again, uh, mo uh, almost all of this runs on device. There's an explicit signal when anything is leaving the device. So I really like this about a way to empower people to learn more about the world around them, which has always been a core uh, Google value or act on it, but also to preserve privacy uh, whenever possible. Um, one of the things that's pretty, oh, the video's not gonna play. Um, it's adorable, I promise you. Um, the, uh, is Google Clips. Uh, so this was a camera that we made uh, that is really for parents, uh, especially parents with young kids, uh, and for pet owners initially. And what it does is it uses a whole bunch of little models of AI to decide what kind of pictures to take for you. And it really solves a problem that we identified super early in, our, in on our research. Um, I'm a parent of a seven-year-old and a five-year-old, so this is near and dear to my heart. Parents have a tension of really wanting to capture a lot of photos of their kids and wanting to be in the moment and live life with them and not constantly wherever my phone is, kind of like view your children through this all the time. And so Clips was, was created to try to solve that problem. 
Um, we also made sure that it was very uh, privacy preserving as well. So all imagery is taken and stored on uh, the device itself. It's transferred to your phone and then only if you explicitly uh, back it up to the, to the cloud does that happen. Um, and then more and more of our uh, keyboard work is all happening on device as well. So these are models that are predicting uh, the next letter, next word you might want to type, um, and this is happening uh, all on device as well. A lot of this uh, is happening in another really good video that's not going to play. Uh, that is about something uh, called federated learning. Uh, so we've been putting out some papers recently about a technique uh, called federated learning. The short version of this is you are able to uh, train AI models on the device, not just do prediction on the device. So this is a technique that allows for um, the, the training data and individual data itself to never have to leave the device, but yet the models get better by publishing uh, aggregated uh, information to the cloud, which allows basically everyone's experience to get better without having to sacrifice the privacy of sharing the data. Um, and I also think a human-centered approach to AI is a lot about different definitions of success. So historically, especially in basic AI research scientists, or basic AI research science, the, the goal, how you know if you're done or you did the right thing, is that your model beats the previous model, typically on a specific benchmark. That's fantastic for pushing the, the state of the art forward and the basic research forward, but I think we also need to really develop different definitions of what success is. I think on clips, we did a good job of that. I think things like family link, managing time, really the conversation that started around well-being uh, and JOMO uh, has started. Uh, this is the thing that people are kind of flipping the fear of missing out to the joy of missing out um, and really trying to look at, at a different definition of what a successful product is rather than you clicking on it and looking at it all the time. Um, we're also seeing applications in, in, in really kind of, um, you know, what Rochelle was saying is like human to human connection way. So this is the perspective API uh, that was put out by the Jigsaw team that's really trying to detect toxicity in uh, comments online. So it's able to predict whether a particular comment is uh, likely to make somebody leave or not. And so this helps people actually manage online communities and comments. Um, and so really, there's a big long list right, of all these different things. Like AI is in all these different products uh, already doing these kind of small minor uh, improvements. Um, and, so, and so really, like one of the important things for us is to make sure that people have the right platforms and tools and ways of thinking about this, because it's already kind of across almost all these products that we all, all use, or many of us use on a daily basis. Um, so that kind of brings me to the second section, which is really like platforms and tools to build AI for, and I kind of put a dot, dot, dot there because uh, a big thing for me is that I think there are just so many applications of AI that one company or four companies or 10 companies or 30 companies are not gonna figure out all the potential beneficial applications for it, and so you need to create tools so, so people can themselves. Uh, the two big ones that we have are, are Cloud ML System and, of course, uh, TensorFlow, which is our basic framework for building on these things. Um, and they allow for some really interesting both development and research. So this is from the Quick Draw project. If, if people have seen this, it asks people from around the world to draw a bunch of different objects uh, to see if, a, if an AI model could recognize what they were. This is what is creating all the different backgrounds I have in my transition slides. And it allows for some really interesting, actually, uh, I would guess I would call it sociological research on just when you say draw a chair, here are the differences that you see across countries across the world. So in this data, it's starting to, um, AI is starting to be a diagnostic tool in some ways, which I find extremely fascinating. It's a, it's a tool that it, that it will find patterns in the data and it may find ones that humans didn't expect, but then we can take that and learn from that and build on that um, on our own. Uh, another one, yes, it's playing. Um, another one is Facets. So this came out of uh, Pair. Uh, so this is a tool to inspect data sets, to look for um, bias, fairness, uh, really look at um, sub <clears throat> subgroups of data. This is, uh, I know that uh, for at least part of Joy's work, she used Facets. Um, one of the things I really like about Pair um, that, uh, that I really like to attach myself to it is we typically uh, try to make tools or platforms or things people can do to follow the advice we give. So I think giving advice or saying like we should do it this way is really good. Um, I'm also a user researcher, so I know that people tend to do easy over what they're motivated to do. Um, and so I just look at it as like how do we make human-centered AI the easiest option for people? 
And a big part of that is saying, we think you should do this, and here's the tool that allows you to do that pretty easily. Um, another one that we put out is in the embedding projector. So again, this is for uh, very high dimensional data, or if you're trying to go through an embedding space that actually allows you to inspect data that's just very hard to even conceptualize a lot of times uh, for people. Uh, this is where I think some of the challenges of AI is that AI and AI exists at human scale, uh, timelines and physical dimensionality. Uh, where we exist at human scale, timelines and physical dimensionality. And a lot of times where it feels like things are out of control is where those two depart. Uh, this is a, a brilliant project, if you haven't seen it, called Teachable Machine that was done by Alex Chen and a few folks at Google. So this allows you to train an AI model in your browser using your webcam. So you basically train it to recognize a couple different things you do. A lot of times this is something like waving or showing it something, and you have a model that works. This began as kind of almost like a a fun little game or something like that. So uh, it's not up right now, but literally if you get it right, like you get a GIF of a cat like doing its paws like that. Like that's kind of how fun and kind of silly it started. But it's actually allowed for a lot of pretty substantial uh, work that people are doing. So this is Oz. Uh, he's uh, a um, homeless veteran uh, developer down in Portland uh, that we went and met the other day. And, and he's trying to use it to, he's trying to use Deep Learn to actually develop a way for his friend who is paralyzed to navigate the web uh, using only his eyes. Um, so it's, it's these platforms that sometimes kind of start as almost like a little experiment or like let's see what we can make this do, turn into something that other people can try to use to change somebody's, uh, somebody that they care about's life. And you can just kind of do anything. This is another one I just love. This is just a raccoon detector that a guy made. <laughs> Uh, he just posted it online, and when asked about raccoons, he, his response was just kind of like, I just like raccoons. Um, uh, maybe he's like, I guess some raccoons were coming to his back door, and he really wanted to know when they were there, so he made himself a raccoon detector. Um, and it, you know, it's a way to kind of, I think, show the flexibility here uh, of what can be done. Um, on a more serious note, we've also seen a lot of um, work being done uh, in the healthcare industry, specifically with um, reading x-rays. This is some work that showed um, performance that's outperforming uh, uh, doctors and helping them find uh, tumors in, in these kind of x-rays. Like this is a really good uh, machine problem uh, to help a human make a decision here that, we're, that you know, it is literally leaving, leading to saving lives. Uh, another one is all these predictions that are happening at, uh, out of the diabetic retinopathy work. So this is really uh, trying to use an image of the retina to predict uh, diabetes, but also they're starting to find very interesting uh, correlations or, or predictions that they could make that they didn't understand they could make. One of the biggest things here is that, is that it brings down the cost of, uh, of uh, doing these kind of exams or scans to next to nothing, um, and then it also gives them scale, because if it's something you can do with a smartphone, you've just reached scale uh, across a much larger portion of the world than if you need some kind of specialized hardware. Um, this is another example uh, where they're using uh, models built on TensorFlow to inspect cassava for disease to try to um, better uh, uh, predict that disease and root it out before it destroys crops. Um, here's one that just came out this week, um, building TensorFlow models to predict wildfires. So again, the, one of the ways that I like to think about AI is I'm sometimes on the other end of the AGI spectrum of, I, I consider, I say, now we have cheap, narrow prediction, because that's all most AI models do. What would you do with cheap, narrow prediction? And at that point, the only limiting factor is how many problems do you think are problems of being able to predict something? Because if that's, that's the boundary zone of the problems that AI could, could help address. Um, another one that's near and dear to my heart, so this is AIY projects. This is a project I worked on for 18 months. Uh, it's all about like little maker kits, so these little cardboard kits. You self-assemble them. Uh, you can make like a little uh, speaker and mic. We have another one that's a vision kit that's a little camera, runs everything on device. Um, and these allow you to do all these different kind of projects. This is a, a maker, a very famous maker in the maker, or anybody in the maker community in the audience? A little bit, okay. So uh, Alice, uh, Alistair Alistair is a guy there. He made basically a little dinosaur that follows, that uses a facial recognition model to follow you uh, with its little gaze. Um, but one of the things I really love is tweets like this. So after we released our very first kit, the voice kit, 
We got this tweet, and this guy tweeted, had fun building the AIY project this weekend with my, fun, with, <laughs> with my son, uh, his first electronics project. The thing that blows me away about this is this kid's first electronics project was with AI, right? It's like this is, I truly consider this a generational shift. Like his first exposure to it was, this is a thing I can build with and control and make it do what I want. Like that's amazing. Like that's that's the, that's the kind of kind of shift and change and things that we're that we're trying to bring here. Um, and then really the last part is really what we want to do is broaden the conversation. So we kicked off um, with some of our putting out some internal thinking we've been doing. Again, this is like derivative of a bunch of internal decks and some of us trying to go around and be like, hey, I think we should care about this. I think this might be a thing. I'm not sure. And it matures into more of a, a body of knowledge. And and so we put out this initial article that was called Human Centered Machine Learning. Um, we have now a, a whole, um, I don't know what you call it, collection channel, something like that, on our design.google library. So we have 11 articles out there now, more coming. Like our intention is as we learn to put it out there so more and more people can do human centered design, uh, um, uh, human centered AI. Uh, it's not just text, there's lots of like interesting, we're trying to make things as interactive and as demonstrative as possible. Um, another really great example of this, if you're interested, is something called distill.pub. This is done by two of the researchers in the Google research um, um, team, and I, I truly think that they're like changing the way people are going to start understanding these concepts. So moving from like a static paper that lives somewhere to a combination of explanatory text and demonstrations and playgrounds that, and sandboxes that you can play with and start to understand these concepts yourself. Um, so really, when I look at human-centered AI at Google, like what do I think is next? Um, I think we're gonna, you know, we have everyday AI. We just this week on Thursday released our AI principles. But then, I, I like principles. I'm a huge fan of principles. I really like the accompanying one that's about what they call responsible AI that gets into way more detail and has way more concrete things to do. So we're gonna see more responsible everyday AI. AI. Uh, platforms and tools to enable anyone to learn and build AI for themselves or for their communities to solve more and more problems. There's too many problems for one company or a handful of companies or dozens of companies to solve, so we need to get this into people's hands and a broader and more inclusive conversation and development. Um, and I'll just kind of end with a, a quote I think about a lot, uh, which is from Kevin Slavin, uh, especially in the Valley. They talk about software eating the world all the time, and I love the one that says, we can build software to eat the world or software to feed it, and I think it's our choice. Thanks. Thank you, Jess. Wonderful examples. So as we went from general design to product design and technology, let's go down a bit more further to services. I'd like to invite Deb Roy, who is an associate professor at MIT Media Lab, where he directs the lab of social machines, working on methods in media analytics and media design. Many of you may remember Deb's TED talk, Birth of a World, which, in which he presented research done is his own son's language development that led to new ideas in media analytics. Debbie is also the co-founder and a chairman of Cortico, a not-for-profit media technology that is developing media technologies and services with the aim of improving the health of discourse in the public sphere. So let's dive into the services of human sector design. Thank you, Deb. Well, thank you. Um, I I'm going to jump right in and, uh, first of all, just define that there, I'm speaking on behalf of two organizations, Lab for Social Machines, which is based at the MIT Media Lab, and Cortico, which is a nonprofit. And the division of labor between the two is uh, shown in this Venn diagram where we research, develop new algorithms in the MIT Lab, uh, we'll work together to prototype uh, applications of those algorithms, and then if we want to try to deploy something and create an actual product uh, that we can maintain and support out in the world, uh, that's a job for Cortico. Um, this is the team as of a year ago. We've grown a little bit since um, of the uh, uh, folks from both Cortico and MIT together. Um, I want to start by sharing this, uh, this image. Um, this was a uh, uh, visualization of a uh, roughly a million Twitter accounts after we did our best at filtering out bots. Uh, these were accounts that were active tweeting about the U.S. presidential election in 2016. 
And <clears throat> I'm just going to point out one thing, and this is a lot of things I could talk about, but just the general structure here in red on the right is what we call the Trump tribe. These are um, individuals who are um, solely following Donald Trump's account on Twitter uh, um, during the run-up to the election. In green is the Sanders tribe. In blue, quite diffuse and kind of covered by magenta, is the Clinton tribe. In magenta are, are accounts that were following Trump and Clinton. Um, we did a lot of analysis to look at fragmentation, balkanization of this uh, sample, which was representative, uh, we believe, of uh, more uh, kind of large-scale patterns on Twitter. Um, we also then, uh, after the election was over, gathered a sample of journalists who had written about the election. Uh, these were journalists who wrote in roughly 30 publications across the political spectrum, from MSNBC uh, all the way to Infowars and Breitbart. Uh, took a sample of 30,000 journalists, found their Twitter handles, because we're just curious, where are they in this landscape uh, that's sort of uh, so clearly fragmented? Um, so when we light up the journalists in blue, the verified and yellow, uh, the unverified journalists, um, you see a, a very striking pattern, in some ways not surprising, that the journalists um, are all on one side of this, this divide. To be in that red tribe on the right, uh, you would have to only follow uh, Trump at the exclusion of the other candidates across uh, you know, both parties in the primary. So um, the, the reason I'm starting with this slide is to just give you the sense that um, the, in this case, the view through the lens of Twitter gives us a picture of the way many of us felt by the time the election was over, that the narratives we were relying on to understand what was happening in, in this country, to understand how other Americans were thinking about the election, uh, were based on a group of journalists that were largely at a personal level disconnected from large parts of the country. And there was this positive of local news <clears throat> and local polling. Uh, which in the past, local news existed. It's been decimated over the decades. Um, and so this sort of became our problem statement for what we've been working on over the last, uh, uh, actually, um, more than a couple of years, but really came into focus uh, with, with this image. Um, so, you know, we have this situation where um, news often fails to uh, reflect the local lived experience. Um, it's turning out, as you analyze what's happening in our overall media ecosystem, which is largely a, a for-profit um, ecosystem, and by the way, I've built for-profit companies, nothing against profit, but when you analyze the dynamics of our media environment, which will be the, 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 my focus today, um, it turns out polarization is a great business model. Um, it turns out that um, whether it's uh, by editorial uh, decision or actually by algorithmic um, bias, uh, loudest voices tend to be elevated, um, and there's a certain kind of playbook. I'm not saying it's used universally, but I'm sure uh, you can recognize this in some of the media you have been exposed to, that a kind of divide and enrage playbook is pretty effective if you, your singular aim is um, to uh, create an engaged audience, because enragement is a kind of engagement, and if you can sell that, and if from an advertiser perspective you're looking for efficient access to uh, engaged eyeballs, um, you have a, a, uh, a plausible system that can um, support, it, uh, support itself. Um, of course, there are problems with this as we continue to optimize and get a more and more efficient media ecosystem. Um, and this is sort of the picture that defines sort of our, what, what we see as a, sort of the danger or the real problem, which is a balkanization or a fragmentation of the public sphere. Um, I know this is a, a meeting about uh, the role of AI in, in human systems, and I think there's enough that's already been said today that, of course, AI used for targeting, used to weave the networks and essential that we all inhabit, to use Tim's phrase of the machine we're all uh, in inhabiting, um, is uh, in the fabric of our media ecosystem now. And um, there are very human, very natural, very uh, good tendencies of wanting to belong and wanting to find environments uh, that where we feel like our ideas um, are consistent with those around us, that sort of self-sorting behavior, those tribal um, uh, instincts, when you take all the friction out of the system, can lead us uh, into what, what at least our team feels is pretty problematic um, territory. So here's what we're doing. Um, 
This is a, um, a sketch of three kinds of activities that we're constantly across our lab and across Cortico thinking about. Um, are there ways to surface what we call underheard community voices and narratives um, that become raw materials, if you will, for creating bridges across communities that increasingly, if you look at what the media ecosystem is doing, is actually um, uh, uh, cleaving apart? And how do we know if we're making progress? Can we define uh, metrics to uh, measure and track the health of the public sphere. And I'm going to now go faster uh, to make sure I uh, just cover some of the... Uh, the uh, I'm not going to go in a lot of detail here. I'm going to just give you a sense of some concrete things we're doing. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be around <clears throat> in the afternoon in case anyone wants to dig in. So uh, the first idea that uh, we've been spending a lot of time on is this idea of imagine a green movement for the media industry. Um, 20 years ago, if you were a brand, if you were a for-profit organization, being green was actually a net negative. It meant you were somehow distracted, you were suboptimal, you were putting some of your attention elsewhere, not doing the best you possibly could at your core product. Today, fast forward, being lead certified, being green is actually a position of strength for a brand. Um, so we think it's a pretty interesting analogy. Um, one of the things that this analogy would require to make real in the media ecosystem is some kind of a, an air quality index for the public sphere. So as actors in our public sphere are acting, if they're giving off pollutants as a byproduct, there is a way to actually uh, measure um, and make that, um, that visible. Um, something that we've been thinking about is a, uh, some kind of a measure that um, gives you a sense of are you increasing a sense of shared reality across groups uh, in a way that humanizes as opposed to dehumanizing uh, others. Um, so I'll give you two quick examples now of how we're doing this. Uh, we partnered with Frontline, uh, which is, of course, one of the, the crown jewels of PBS. Frontline came to us uh, about a year ago. They said, hey, we've noticed that uh, our historically politically balanced sort of bridge content that we uh, uh, create uh, through broadcast television and through video streaming on Facebook has become polarized. Our audience is becoming very left-leaning. We're alarmed. We don't care that our audience is growing. We care that we remain a kind of bridge across audiences. Um, so we've been analyzing. This is just a, um, a, a visual of a Twitter cascade. We've been studying the diffusion of uh, their content through Twitter, not through Facebook, through Twitter, because we can see clearly how the different episodes diffuse. Uh, in blue, this shows uh, left-leaning uh, Twitter accounts that are diffusing uh, one episode versus uh, a different episode produced by Frontline has very different affinity, uh, naturally, depending on content. What we're doing is working with Frontline to design experiments, including targeted advertising, which PBS usually doesn't do, to actually try to optimize for the diffusion of their content that creates uh, cross-tribe reach. And we're also going to be monitoring the conversations across different groups to see whether there's a civil uh, and uh, a sense of shared reality that uh, uh, creates the right kind of conversations. Um, the point of this, my sharing this with you is, um, as we do these experiments, it gives us a basis for defining a new kind of metric. Um, that in this case, a uh, reasonable scale publisher is going to optimize for jointly. They care that they reach an audience, but they also care about how and what kind of uh, cross, cross uh, group reach they, they achieve. Second example, this is Bridget Mendler. Uh, if you have daughters that are uh, between the ages of, I don't know, 10 and 20, they probably know who she is. Um, she was uh, a child actress in, uh, in Disney. Uh, she is now a very successful uh, songer, sing uh, uh, singer and songwriter. She has several million followers on Twitter, also on Facebook. Um, if you look at her Twitter feed, she does a very interesting kind of engagement with her, her fan base. She joined our lab um, uh, in the fall um, and expressed this interest in being able to more systematically understand the effects that she was having as she prompted conversations with her fan base. Um, and so these are actually visualizations from a tool that Bridget has built um, over the past uh, few months, where uh, the top node is a celebrity tweet, 
and the cascades that result, color-coded by emotional content, this she considers a relatively a pure consumption experience. It's a selfie and a number of fans, thousands of fans, just tweeting a very simple uh, uh, kind of response. Um, a second example of a conversation tree uh, uh, from a different celebrity that leads to color code and emotion and the structure, a certain kind of pattern that we're starting to identify as uh, sort of positive and meaningful discourse. Um, and finally, an example of a very uh, divisive um, and kind of provocative um, a celebrity in this case, uh, who shall remain unnamed, uh, leading to a very different kind. So what we're, we're, we're trying to do here is actually characterize, first of all, just start to see what different kind of species of these conversation trees uh, exist in the wild, um, and then can we develop ways to characterize and systematically measure the influence of these influencer-prompted conversations. Um, a lot of the challenges around toxicity are uh, really fascinating. If you train a machine learning algorithm to uh, judge the toxicity of the actual fan conversations. It's highly context dependent. You have to understand the, the exact uh, context within which uh, this particular cele celebrity tends to operate to understand whether a, a given tweet in one context may be toxic and another uh, not so much. Um, this is a tweet from uh, Jack Dorsey, um, where he, um, uh, we're, we're grateful that he cited Cortico and, and uh, social machines for introducing them to this concept of conversational health, um, and actually opened this uh, thread, this is a few months ago, uh, formally publicly committing Twitter uh, to increase the collective health, openness, and civility of public conversation, um, and to hold themselves accountable towards progress. They've since run uh, on RFP, uh, have, have a number of proposals that have come in. Um, so we're, we're really uh, happy to see one of the major social media platforms uh, taking some of these ideas and starting to develop uh, uh, alternate methods internally. Uh, I think Tristan Harris is here. It, there's, uh, we've had a lot of conversation around the need to have some kind of more uh, organized and coordinated way as the different platforms. Facebook, of course, has um, analogous set of possibilities. Uh, so does YouTube. How do we, as a community, think about the, the metrics that can be defined outside of any one platform, and how do they tie in and coordinate with internal metrics? I think these are important questions ahead. But as I've tried to share today, we're also looking at the connection to uh, publishers and influencers, and finally, uh, advertisers, brand advertisers, are a really important part of this ecosystem as well. Um, okay, uh, let me sh shift gears and share with you one other dimension of the work uh, that we're investing a lot of our effort in. Um, and the, the question I want to begin with is, what happened to local roots of media and democracy? And this is very much a, a question we're asking in, in an American context, although I suspect there are uh, parallels to a, a lot of other uh, media markets. I just want to um, take a minute to uh, read a couple of key lines from an economist that perhaps some of you have not heard of. Uh, E.F. Schumacher, arguably one of the first environmental economists, um, wrote a, a book that I highly recommend. If anything I've talked about, the topic is of interest, uh, it's worth reading this book, Small is Beautiful, Economics as if people matter. This was written in 1973. And here's the, to me the key line as a technologist. A highly developed transport and communications uh, system, I should have put in there on my flight over this morning, a highly developed transport and communication system has one immensely powerful effect. It makes people footloose. Everything in this world has to have a structure, otherwise it is chaos. Before the advent of mass transport and mass communications, the structure was simply there. Now a great deal of structure has collapsed and a country is like a cargo ship in which the load is in no way secured. It tilts and all the load slips over and the ship flounders. While people with an easygoing kind of logic believe that fast transport and instantaneous communications open up a new dimension of freedom, they overlook the fact that these achievements also tend to destroy freedom by making everything extremely vulnerable and extremely insecure. The result is a dual society without any, any inner cohesion subject to a maximum of political instability. So this was written in 1973. This idea of technology being foot loosening, you know, this was written before the internet, basically. Right? But the internet is the ultimate expression of a foot-loosening communication technology. It's a, a distance-conquering machine 
But paradoxically, when people are already close together, it can create distance. It's kind of like the equivalent of passing someone on a sidewalk that you don't know versus passing them in a car. The car lets you get further and faster, but it has very interesting um, effects on human behavior that it, it, it selects for. Um, so we started imagining some technologies that are designed to re-anchor. And actually, because I've talked longer than I expected, I'm just going to share one and then stop. Um, if you try Googling this, what are people in the Rust Belt saying about the Me Too movement? You're not going to get really very good results. We were imagining, hey, what if a journalist wanted to actually understand what people were thinking in some spot in America? Um, polling's not giving them what they need. The local affiliates that they used to call up are gone because the local news has died. Um, so why isn't there a search engine that lets you do this? Um, what are people near the border saying about building a wall? Now, why can't we just figure this out? The internet's here, everyone's talking. Um, so that's what Cortico is doing. Um, and what we've been doing is mining what we call ambient, publicly visible local media. A lot of it's just hiding in plain sight. Of course, there's Twitter and there's local subreddits. There's also radio, the original. You know, if you think about the call-in uh, voice on radio, it's the original tweet before there was an internet. Uh, there's email listservs, public listservs. There's local television. There's local news. There's a lot of fragmented content. Um, and if you do the right kind of AI and scraping and so forth, um, you can build a pretty powerful engine, it turns out. Um, and that's what we, we have a first prototype of. And the use case that's motivated this is what we call locally grounded journalism, letting a journalist have her ear to the ground and, and go back to being able to hear what everyday Americans are saying about something and bring that into how they generate new story leads and how they do the reporting. Um, I'm over time. I promise to uh, keep it at 15 minutes. So I'm going to not tell you about the last work we're doing and, and stop here. But thank you. As we have a few minutes together, uh, I'd like to invite the speakers to, to probably help us understand a little bit more because they give us a good context of uh, measure of a shared uh, reality. And from that perspective, I would like to come back to, to Rochelle and, and, and Jess about, you talked about augmenting intelligence with AI in terms of concept of human-centered design. How can we actually measure augmenting intelligence? in this context. Okay. Say the question again, Amir. How can we measure? How can we measure augmented intelligence? Because we, you, you basically shared that augmenting intelligence is the, the core of human-centered design. Yeah. And taking Deb's example, yeah. how would you evaluate that? Yeah. So it's a great question. So I think we have to think about, I mean, we talk about IDEO, our purpose is to create disproportionate positive impact through design, right? And so I think we have to be cognizant. I mean, there could be a lot of impact, but it may not be positive. So, I mean, I think you have to think about what, what is the problem we're trying to solve. And I like, I like Jess's example of like narrow predictions as opposed to, to larger predictions. I don't think I have a great answer, honestly. I think it's hard to, hard to measure. I mean, and it takes time, right? I mean, I think sometimes it's, it's only through the longer tail um, of design that you finally understand the impact. So I don't have a quick answer. Hopefully just does. Yep, it's, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, I, I think that it, it makes me think of two things. One is I'm, I'm really, in, I think they're really fascinating. I'd like to see more of these, where sometimes called centaur competitions. So it's pairing humans and AI to try to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. And so you can actually see how human only perform versus uh, AI only versus, versus pairings. And that gives you a bit of a way to actually compare the different options, uh, which is really good. I, I think one of the other parts, though, is you always get a, you always chase the tail of how are you defining success. And I think sometimes what we don't like is that's a tough, ugly conversation sometimes because that like actually forces people to talk about ethics. It actually talk, forces people to talk about the relationship of what they're doing to a broader ecosystem. And a lot of people just don't want to deal with that. They just kind of want to do some narrow work and hope by some miracle that like you know, a little sprinkle of tech <clears throat> solves this very complicated system. And it's just rarely the case, and it will almost always 
Uh, let me say, like, one of the things that it almost always suffers from is you almost always optimize for the wrong thing if you're not very inclusive in the beginning to define that with the people that will be affected by what you're doing. So you're proclaiming a very large initial design thinking. Um, how would you answer to that, Deb, yourself? I was, just gonna, I was gonna connect back to um, Tim O'Reilly's comments from earlier that maybe if you were to measure augmented intelligence, one metric is however you define intelligence, which is gonna be hard, so maybe task dependent, but um, just to come back to his point about is a machine working with an AI, you know, if the AI is a, a power tool, that's one model, and agency is in the hands of who's using the tool, and the other is the human is somehow encapsulated in as a cog in the machine. So I, I think any kind of a metric, um, in addition to seeing how well does the human machine system perform, you know, the centaur, the, uh, you know, the, the human and the chess player working together, is this question of who's managing who, and some separate orthogonal axis for agency. Um, and if the human is being robbed of agency in the process of creating a, a higher performing system, um, we want to be able to um, uh, capture that or be sensitive to that because, well, because we're humans and, and meaning matters. So from a um, human-centered design perspective, uh, are you suggesting that augmenting intelligence between collaboration between humans and machines is probably one area that we have to make progress on in terms of design thinking before it's deployed and implemented and, and launched as products. Because I love the, the idea of a search box that Deb showed where we can ask very difficult questions which basically is hiding very complex set of individuals and discrete, probably as we suggested, just cheap prediction models but how can we think about that? How can one would think about designing such a box that Deb show? You may have an idea yourself because you're, you're trying to build it. Well, I just think about um, Bill Mitchell, who was uh, our dean of the School of Architecture at MIT, had what I thought was the simplest explanation of how design research works, I, I suspect maybe related to IDEO ethos, but he had a, um, it was a two-step process, so it was very easy to remember. Um, step one, speculate. Step two, critique and iterate. And hopefully, through each iteration, your speculative act gets better. But the reason I loved his choice of words was the word speculate, built into it as a reminder that you won't know the answers, but you're gonna build it anyways. So I think the idea of thinking about the design principles first and then, you know, that's just not reality. Um, but if you don't have this critique, and, 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 and Bill would always remind us that the people you want in the room to critique uh, may be very different than the ones that enter the speculative process, and you don't want them to start to design for you either. So kind of separating these steps and realizing that I think we're already, I mean, AI as augment, you know, as, as sort of tools for people, that's, that's so already out there. are we saying that we're changing the nature of human-centered design as well, with AI progressing? I don't think we're changing it. I mean, I think at the core for IDEO, we're, we're you know, a human-centered firm, and we rely very heavily on our qualitative research, and I don't think that's changed. I think what you're seeing for us is adding data sets, sort of, I, I don't know if we would call it speculate, but I mean, we would have our qualitative research, but we would add the quantitative element. Right, so we're merging the two as opposed to abandoning at the core the qualitative element, which is, you know, what are we hearing from people? What are we observing from people? What are sort of the more nuanced things we're picking up through our qualitative, but then using more quantitative to sort of understand broader populations or test theories over time or things like that. So I think for us, it's again, even our design research, we're using the AI to augment what we did before, not to replace it. Uh, I would like to ask a question to Jess about uh, the topic of uh, trust, democracy, human rights by design. You, 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 you said that within Google and your own work, you're thinking a lot about making AI available to everyone. How this then translates in terms of democracy, human rights, from a designer, researcher perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that, you know, to make 
there, there's, a, there's a slide I pulled out in my talk that says something to the effect of if, if something is not uh, low cost or can reach as many people in the world, it's, it's neither revolutionary nor something else. Like, it's, it's essentially an argument about, about access to, to technology is the only way to truly make these kind of um, truly like global, global changes there. I, I think it's also a lot about how, you know, it, in, the, in a lot of ways it gets back to focusing on the, on the right problems and so the human rights framework and things that have already been mentioned there are, uh, seem like the right problems to focus on. And then it's really, uh, it's just to connect to some other threads, there's a lot of qualitative research to understand how a system with all its actors and all its first and second order effects occur and then it's to find the places where AI can actually contribute throughout the process. So that's the other thing is people sub in AI for just intelligence or to be able to solve a problem that we couldn't otherwise solve. And sometimes you dig into something and you realize actually AI is, it's not a prediction challenge in this case. Like it's something else. And AI is not going to help us solve problems where the prediction problem isn't the core issue. Um, and again, this kind of gets back to those hard conversations um, that I think a lot of people don't want to deal with. Thank you. Do you have time for a question or two? I think we should probably wrap up then. Uh, well, it was fascinating. Thank you very much for your contributions and the talks. Uh, it was, I was fascinated personally to, to hear the phrasing that you had about making AI available to everyone by augmenting it and also the concept of shared reality. I think it's, it's not easy to understand, but I think that we did a great job also to, to bring it together. Thank you very much and welcome.